Thanks for coming. I hope you're having a good time so far. So the title of my talk is, is perhaps a little misleading because it's not entirely about thinking hard. It's about thinking a little bit uh, creatively and differently. Uh, we call, I call my blog The O'Reilly Radar because it's about detecting trends, thinking about the future. And I often pepper my talks with quotes about the future. And one that uh, I've used for a number of years is one from Ray Kurzweil. And he said, I'm an inventor. I became interested in long-term trends because an invention has to make sense in the world in which it is finished, not the world in which it has started. Now, we are in an industry that's in the midst of enormous change. Uh, it's accelerating, and that gets a, a lot of opportunity, uh, some real risks. But we're also in a world of great change. And of course, that's what Kurzweil is talking about. He became fascinated with big long-term technology trends. And he makes slides like this one, uh, which shows the, you know, the acceleration of supercomputing power. And uh, he's out there you know, looking out. By 2015, he thinks we'll have uh, supercomputers that are uh, good enough to, to uh, simulate a human brain. Uh, you know, and actually, in uh, 2025, supercomputers will be uh, powerful enough uh, to actually upload the contents of a brain. That's kind of crazy shit, huh? I mean, maybe, maybe not. But there are other curves that uh, come to mind when I think about uh, these increasing returns. Now, here's the one that, that Al Gore made famous in An Inconvenient Truth, uh, or, uh, which is uh, the so-called Keeling curve, uh, the, the rise in atmospheric uh, uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, here's another one that I've been fond of showing in the context of my talks on Gov2.0, the rise in government spending and the increase in the amount of our economy that's actually taken up by the government. Uh, here's the, the, the rise of our... Uh, health care expenditures in the U.S. And, of course, this is one that I think is really interesting, too, which is, of course, the Hubbard curve, which is the peak oil graph. Uh, if you're not familiar with this and its implications for our future economy, it's something I suggest you, you think about. It's an illustration of something Ray Kurzweil doesn't really take into account, and it's expressed by Stein's law. Herbert Stein, the economist, said, if something can't go on forever, it will stop. And there certainly are many, many risks uh, to this world of accelerating returns that Ray Kurzweil talks about with the idea that we're just going to go on and uh, things are going to get better and better and more and more interesting uh, because it may not be the case. And that's why two years ago at this conference I gave a talk uh, in which I said we're living in a bubble. And I started at this point, this is before the financial crash. It's not an investment bubble. It's a reality bubble. Yeah, we do have financial crises coming out, we, but we also have income inequality. We have an oil price shock. We have global warming. We have decline in science literacy and education. We have water scarcity, exotic diseases coming on, aging populations and soaring health costs, de decline in economic competitiveness, and a dysfunctional political system. So there's a lot of really not so great stuff. So let's not keep patting ourselves on the back. And more than that, I made a call to our tech community to stop uh, you know, building trivial apps and instead to work on stuff that matters. Now, as I've thought about that over the last couple of years, I've been trying to come to grips with what does matter? What should we be working on? And my thinking has evolved a little bit, and I want to share that thinking with you. Uh, First, you go look at the National Academy of Engineering and you look at their uh, so-called grand challenges. And I realize I, I need to go over here because my eyes aren't that good. Uh, you know, they're, they're okay. You know, they're things like make solar energy economical, uh, provide fusion energy, develop carbon sequestration methods, uh, provide access to clean water, re restore and improve urban infrastructure, uh, advance health informatics. They're starting to get kind of vague, don't you think? Engineer better medicines. Uh, you know, prevent nuclear terror, secure cyberspace. I just kind of, they start kind of sounding a little bit like what T.S. Eliot called thoughts of a dry brain in a dry season. There's no juice there, right? And I, when I started thinking about the grand challenges of the past, you know, they were kind of crazy. You know, it's like, let's fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, you know, which seemed like this impossible thing and also useless. I mean, what was it for? You know, let's put a man on the moon, what was that really for? But yet, these are the kinds of crazy things that inspire young people 
frighten old people uh, and actually lead to some of the changes that end up becoming really important in our world. So looking back at Ray Kurzweil's graph, I think maybe he's not so crazy to be saying, hey, one of our grand challenges is let's be able to upload our brains into a computer. You know, that's the same kind of crazy thing as let's put a man on the moon as opposed to some very, you know, careful, practical, this is what we need to do and let's nobody be inspired by it. So, and there was a really wonderful um, blog post just the other day by uh, Alex Steffen at World Changing. And uh, it was called Why Our Bright Green Futures Will Be Weirder Than, than We Think. And he, he wrote, the world we need is one we've never yet seen. He says, that's terrifying for many people, but it can also be exhilarating. Though it's true that the sort of solutions we need are probably non-intuitive, radically innovative, downright weird, that also means that we have an opportunity to re-examine the broken fundamentals of our current model of prosperity and redesign them. We could well end up yet with a future that is far better than our present. But in order to do that, we have to invent that future. And that leads me to another one of my favorite quotes about the future from Alan Kay. He said, it's easier to invent the future than it is to predict it. And that's the enterprise that all of you are engaged in. You are engaged in the process of inventing the future. And it's not something that's done by any one person. It's done by all of us collectively. Uh, but there are some principles. And I, I've been sort of trying to put together some of my thoughts on what, how do we build a better future. And it's funny because the first idea that came to me was that, well, it wasn't just about the idea that there's entrepreneurs. It was really about that there's a set of factors. And I came up with the image of a four-cylinder engine. And the first cylinder, fire, you know, with, a, with an engine, the, the, the cylinders have to fire in the right order or, uh, you know, you have bad timing and the engine locks up. And the first cylinder actually seems to me is that people have to be having fun. You know, that's why I, I kind of looked at those grand challenges and said, there's something wrong there. There's no fun in them. There's no life. There's no juice. You know, when the Wright brothers set out to fly, they weren't saying, oh yeah, we're going to invent the airline industry and we're going to change global travel patterns. They were like, wow, do you think we could get up there and fly? How cool would that be? And, you know, when the early pioneers of the computer industry, the kind of people that Steve Levy wrote about in Hackers, which we just republished in a 25th anniversary edition, uh, you know, they were like, oh my God, I could have my own computer. How cool is that? So that first cylinder is just having fun. You know, and then out of that fun and that ferment of fun, some people start to think big, you know, and... So, you know, the early Microsoft guys, like, you know, we could actually have a PC on every desk and in every home, you know? And, uh, you know, the Google guys, when everybody had kind of thought, oh, search, that's not really a market, they, they had this big idea. We're going to create access to all the world's information. So that's the second cylinder of the innovation engine. You know, somebody out of that world where people are just doing it for the hell of it starts to see the potential. You know, you don't just start from, oh yeah, we're going to go make a big company. You start from, from love and joy, and then you start to see that potential in some unexpected way. So, and then the third stage is where I think most people think that innovation starts with, with companies, with entrepreneurs, with venture capitalists. And I think it's certainly true that uh, you have to do that, but you start after you've figured out a really big idea. And I think the really great companies do have big ideas. You know, when you talk to uh, the founders of any of the companies whose logos I put up there, you realize how visionary they are. They have a big idea, but they've also had the discipline, the energy, the insight uh, to build a company, to find a business model, and really to grow an ecosystem. And that's really the... Uh, by the way, there's a wonderful blog uh, I want to point you to. It, it, it's um, from Ben Horowitz, who's Mark Andreessen's partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, but he has a fabulous post uh, called Taking the Mystery Out of Scaling a Company. Uh, worth uh, definitely looking at if you're trying to think, how do you go from your idea to really become big? Uh, he's got some great insights. But the, the, the fourth cylinder 
is actually about creating value, not just for your company, but for other people. And that's this theme that we've been talking about here, the power of platforms. So when Steve Jobs got up there at WWDC and said, we have handed out $1 billion to app developers, you know, sure, he's bragging about how great Apple is, but he's really talking about the fact that at this particular t- point in time, Apple is creating an ecosystem that is allowing other people besides Apple to make money. Similarly, you think about the web, you know, how much money Google enabled other people to make. You know, their whole genius was in sending people off their site when everybody else was trying to be sticky and bring people only to their own site. They were handing off value right and left, and they created value for themselves by creating value for other people. And this is a, a, a really interesting report that they released uh, 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 that recently, uh, that released, um, that, that sort of tries to quantify their economic impact just by measuring you know, how much money was flowing through their advertising ecosystem. Uh, but it, probably the best example of an entrepreneur who really thought hard about ecosystem building is Henry Ford. You know, we tend to associate him with the Model T and with the assembly line, but we forget uh, that he invented the weekend. You know, he sat there and he said, I want to build this affordable car, but wait, there's not enough people who could buy it. So he, 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 he paid his people more than the prevailing wage because he figured, wow, they have to be able to do this. And he said, oh, wow, and they have to have time to start driving. And so he, he made the five-day work week and really started thinking a lot about how all of the e- ecosystem that would support the future that he was trying to build. And the reason why I mention this is I'm, I'm somewhat worried. Uh, we're at this very exciting stage uh, in our industry where a lot of great companies have been built and now they're starting to fight over who's going to own what. And that's the theme of our uh, Web2 Summit in November is points of control. Uh, you know, as companies are starting to bump into each other, it reminded me of uh, the old sort of battles for control of uh, uh, the pathways into India between England and Russia. It was called the Great Game back in the Victorian era. And so John Battelle came up with this wonderful sort of map, interactive map on the web2summit.com site, sort of showing some of the players, who they might have to acquire, where they might want to go, how they might attack each other. Uh, and that's all kind of fun, and the competition is really good in the early stages. But I'm really worried that some of these companies are, are, stru- are forgetting to think about creating a sustainable ecosystem, and they're trying to divide up the pie rather than grow the pie. And so I will say this, you know, in that innovation cycle, uh, that fourth cylinder to keep the ecosystem going, create more value than you capture, is an essential one. You know, I look back... Almost everything I know, everything I talk about, I've come from the lessons of the personal computer industry, uh, which was an incredibly vital industry with lots of innovation, uh, lots of people making money. But as a couple of big players uh, became dominant, they sucked all the air out of the, out of the ecosystem, and then innovation had to go somewhere else. So when I think about the future, I want to ask myself, where are people having fun today? you know, in ways that might change the world. And one of the areas that uh, has been a focus for us at O'Reilly, uh, it was represented at Maker Faire. How many here in the audience were, were at Maker Faire in New York? Any of you get out there? Not that many of you. Oh, you missed something. It's an amazing event. And here's actually a picture of me and my friend George Wright riding the uh, rocket-powered uh, uh, ride that somebody had put together uh, the jet pony, so, so to speak. It was, it was a, a wild trip. And kind of just the kind of crazy, fun stuff. You go, what's it for? You know, but it turns out in this firm at Maker Faire, you know, tens of thousands of people out of the Bronx, uh, uh, out, uh, sorry, in uh, Queens at the New York Hall of Science in San Francisco and San Mateo, we had something like 80,000 people. They're all coming together to share kind of innovation that's about stuff. You know, it's not just software anymore, it's stuff. And I sometimes call the maker movement smart stuff and dumb stuff made with smart tools. It includes everything from robotics and sensors, automated just-in-time manufacturing, uh, you know, 3D printing, you know, but also all the way up to crowdsource demand, computer vision, affective interfaces, cloud intelligence. All this stuff comes together uh, in this area where people are just playing with technology. 
and we start to see some really interesting stuff. You know, you start to look at the connections between a project that was featured at Maker Faire called the Netduino, which is uh, a, a basically a sensor board, open source sensor board called the Arduino, uh, with uh, sort of a, a, some networking uh, attached, and it's actually in this particular case built uh, with the .NET uh, framework. Uh, you know, it's how do we build network connected sensor? Uh, platforms and people are doing really interesting stuff with it. But then you look at the um, the rhetoric from IBM, their whole smarter planet thing. They're talking about the same world. How do we instrument the world? How do we make it smarter? And you start to see the connections between the people at play and the ambitions of big companies. And if you can follow those paths, I think you'll find some really interesting uh, work and opportunity, interesting problems to solve. So uh, I wrote about this uh, back in 2009 in a paper called Web Squared, Web 205 Years On, where I talked about the impact of sensor networks. I think you have to remember uh, that when you pull out your mobile phone, this is a sensor platform. You know, it's no longer like a, a dumb PC where the only thing you can do on it is type. You know, this thing has eyes, it has ears, it, has, it knows where it is. And all these sensors are connected to cloud intelligence. And that is the world in which uh, you are building. So think about that. If you haven't read this paper, I, I do recommend it. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we see coming out out of that maker movement is a lesson about sensors and cloud data and algorithmic intelligence in real time. So keep those ideas in the forefront of your mind as you build applications. That's the world. Mobile devices all depend on what I've been calling the internet operating system, which is all about uh, those four things. It's also a real sort of effort to start to build intelligence into our applications in the form of feedback loops. You know, when your phone knows where it is, right, it can do all kinds of things that it can't do when, you know, it's just dumb and doesn't have that sense, so to speak. So think about the senses that can start to inform your applications. In, in a lot of ways, I think all of this is adding up uh, to what Kevin Kelly uh, calls a global superorganism. You know, I really believe uh, when I've talked about Web 2.0 and I used the idea that the core of it was that we are building collective intelligence, that uh, this ultimately is about one big computer. We're all part of it. And the applications we create are part of it. And we're starting to figure this out through a kind of play. You know, so we're not sitting there with a grand challenge uh, where we figured out, oh yeah, we're going to do this engineering discipline and it'll take us to some clear destination. We're playing like a baby is playing and learning and we are building a global brain. So some of this is the subject of a new conference that O'Reilly has launched uh, called Strata, which is about data and algorithms and uh, uh, that'll be the hard, crunchy part of this, uh, this talk. Uh, but back to the maker movement, we're also seeing a huge uh, infusion of interest in life sciences. Uh, Erie Gentry started something called BioCurious, and just a garage bio lab, and actually she funded it on, on Kickstarter, which is sort of a great, a great story. There's another really interesting aspect, which is that we're starting to see in the maker movement that how to rethink the culture of consumption. You know, one of the things that is really frightening about our economy and the economic slowdown is it depends on people consuming, you know, wasting, throwing stuff away. And there are a lot of trends that say that's not sustainable. Uh, so how do we have a consumption economy where perhaps we're not consuming stuff, but we're consuming ideas? And you know, we're starting to see uh, in the maker movement, first of all, we have uh, kind of a culture reuse. Uh, out of Brooklyn came uh, Swaparama Rama, which is just sort of sharing and reusing. Uh, we have Etsy, kind of an economy of uh, people making stuff at small scale and selling it to each other. But it's also kind of an interesting thing. I used to think, oh God, Farmville, I, I, can't, I can't believe. How do people spend all this time? But here's this, uh, this huge economy of consumption of stuff that isn't really stuff. And uh, it's kind of interesting because there's even starting to be the social conscience there. It's like, oh, you, you buy this, this virtual stuff and we'll make donations to build a school in Haiti. Uh, but also connect the dots to something like Zipcar. 
right? Here's another thing about sharing. Uh, you know, in a way, how do we rethink the way that we have, our whole economy has worked? And again, really loose connections I'm trying to make here, but if you can see the connections between these things, they will help you to think a little more clearly about where the future is taking us. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually out of time, so I think I may just stop there uh, with this idea that so many of the things I've been interested in my career, open source, Web 2.0, crowdsourcing, the commons, even this new thing I've been talking about with Gov 2.0, it's all about what happens when we work together and about systems that make it easier for us to work together. So, you know, Foursquare starts with a, a, a sort of a game, but it's really about coordinating activity. And I think uh, there are all these fascinating new applications becoming more and more powerful that let us work together, that let us change the world together. We are evolving. And together we will rise to the challenges that will face us as a society. And in order to get to that sort of crazy Ray Kurzweil vision, you know, we're actually going to have to have a heck of a lot of fun. We're going to have to invent a lot of stuff. And you guys are going to have to be a big part of that. So with that, go out, create, have fun. Thank you.